now, the greatest radio shows of all time. Suspense. The Shadow Node. Washington calling David Harding, counter spy. Classic radio theater. The Great Gildersleeve. Fibber McGee and Molly. Dragnet. Gunsmoke. The Lone Ranger. Now, step back into our time machine with your host, Wyatt Cox. Good evening, friends of the Inner Sanctum. We head out west to Dodge City, Kansas for an episode of Gunsmoke. This episode of Gunsmoke, entitled Crow Bait Bob, was originally broadcast November 10th, 1953. Giddy up! <laughs> Around Dodge City and in the territory on West, there's just one way to handle the killers and the spoilers, and that's with a U.S. Marshal and the smell of gun smoke. Gunsmoke, starring William Conrad, the transcribed story of the violence that moved west with young America, and the story of a man who moved with it. I'm that man, Matt Dillon, United States Marshal, the first man they look for and the last they want to meet. It's a chancy job, and it makes a man watchful, and a little lonely. Smart Alex make me so mad. Act like they think about he ain't got a lick of sense in his head. Honest and truth. Honest. I, I, I swear to goodness, Mr. Dillon, these times a man's got to choke his words right back down in his craw to keep him starting up a rucus. Oh, what's the trouble, Chester? What? The, there's a fellow over at the Dodge house, a, a traveling drummer out of Baltimore, and you know what he said? Now what he say? He said they got a railroad train over there in England somewhere that goes 150 miles in three hours flat. Oh, is that so? He said they'll have trains like that here one of these days going clean across the country. In 30 or 40 years, according to him, a man can get on one in New York City and get off a week later in San Francisco. You don't say. Well, now, you don't believe that, do you, Mr. Dillon? Well, I guess we'll just have to wait and see, Chester. No, um, I don't believe it. A human body just ain't built to go that fast. It'd get a man's innards all out of whack, choke him to death trying to breathe. <laughs> maybe, maybe. The good Lord wanted a man to go 50 miles an hour. He'd have he... put wheels on him. <laughs> well, yeah. Good morning, Matt. Hello, Chester. Ah, oh, come on in, Doc. Oh, my, i just been at the livery stable, Matt. Well, what's the matter? Is Moss sick? No, it's old crowbait Bob. Moss Grimmick's been letting him sleep in the hayloft in return for helping with the chores. Yeah, I heard he has. Well, old crowbait took sick in the night sometime. He couldn't get up this morning. Well, what's wrong with him? Well, nothing that 30 years off his age wouldn't cure. And a thousand or so less bottles of rot gut whiskey. Well, if he's sick, we ought to get him out of that hayloft. Well, but I can't figure any place to move him. He wants to see you, Matt. Right away. See me? What for? Well, I wouldn't say. But he claims it's mighty important. It's something he wants to do before he dies. Before he dies? Mm -hmm. I'm just trying to make him comfortable, Matt. That's all I can do. I'm concerned, Marshal. You're the only man in Dodge City that's worth a hoot and a holler. Except Moss Grimmick. Why, but for him and... Uh -huh. Marshal, I'm a goddamn liar. Uh, what do you mean, Bob? Oh, there's lots of nice folks here. Of course he is. I reckon the only ones I'm really talking about is that high-fluting niece of mine and that 
sneaky old husband of hers. You know, I was uh, wondering, Bob, if uh, maybe we ought to let Ruth and Elbin know about your being sick this No, way. sir, no, no. Let them know nothing. Let them sit out there in the precious ranch and rot. They showed me no care for years. Yeah. Well, uh, it's up to you, I guess. Uh, Marshal, the reason I sent for you is because uh, I want to make my will. Make a will? Oh, I know, I know. It don't seem likely or worth a soul coot like me and have a reason to, but <laughs> that's where you're wrong. Well, Bob, I, I'll do whatever I can, you know. That. Well, I only got one thing to leave. Let's see, it's here. Yes, it's right here in this here leather box. Why don't you take care of it for me, Marshal? See, that it ain't open till after I'm gone. Ah, Bob, that'll probably be years from now. Oh, no, no, you don't know. Doc's trying to fool me, too, but <laughs> I know where I stand. All right, Bob, I'll take care of it for you. Look, uh, Doc's gone after a rig, and we're going to move you over to the jail, huh? At least you'll be warm there, and there'll be somebody with you. And I'll, uh, write up a will of some kind, and... Oh. You can sign it. Yeah, I'm much obliged to you, Marshal. That there box is mighty valuable. I want to be sure the right party gets it. Sure. Uh, who does it go to, Bob? It goes to Miss Kitty. What? Huh? Kitty Russell? Yep. Yeah, she's a fine girl, Marshal. Just a gull darned angel, that's what she is. Just a gull darned angel. That's nice. November 10th, 1956, Gunsmoke on Classic Radio Theater with Wyatt Cox. You know, our friend Richard sent me an email saying, I agree with you. I hated the Gunsmoke TV program, but I really enjoy the Western. And, you know, I always said it was the characters. The characters had a lot to do with it. But there was another reason, and that is they shot Gunsmoke around uh, a lot of their areas out in Southern California. And those people who have been in and around Dodge City, Kansas, know that there are nowhere near that many hills in that part of Kansas. There really aren't. All righty, more of Gunsmoke starring William Conrad uh, from November 10th, 1956. I have to wonder, if this guy's going to die and he's got relatives in town, what are the relatives going to think when... Uh, uh, Miss Kitty gets his uh, belongings. Hello, Kitty. Ah, how does it feel to be an heiress? Oh, stop it. That's all I've been hearing for the last three hours. Yeah. How's the old man, Matt? Oh, we got him moved over to the jail, Kitty. Fixed up a cell for him. And uh, Chester's staying there this evening to look after him. Uh, must be terrible to know you're dying. Be all alone like that with nobody of your own. Yeah. I, uh... I asked him about sending for his niece, Ruth Gudler, and her husband, but uh, he was dead set against that. And I don't blame him. Not the way they've treated him. Yeah. It seems like they might have done something for him. They could have found a place for him out there in the ranch. So he drank too much. Maybe he had a reason to drink. Yeah, maybe. Maybe he is worthless. But he never meant any harm to anyone. Yeah. Crowbait's all right. I, uh, I didn't know that you and him were so thick, though. Uh, I treated him like a human being, that's all. Oh. Good evening, Mac. Kitty. Hello, Doc. <laughs> well, Kitty, 
I hear you're about to inherit a million dollars. That's foolishness, Doc. <laughs> Old Bob never had two quarters to rub together. Yeah, never can tell now. Well, at least you get it, Kitty, whatever it is. Oh, I wish he hadn't done it, Matt. I didn't expect any payment. Payment for what? Nothing. Forget it. Matt, you mean you didn't know? Didn't know what, Doc? Doc, you keep quiet Where now. do you think Crowbait's been getting his meals? I suppose Mars at the livery stable was feeding him. Mars has been letting him sleep there is all. Doc, if you don't... Why, hush... Kitty's been feeding him for the last two years. Kitty, is this true? All right. <coughs> what of it? They waste enough food here in the long branch to feed ten men like him. Didn't cost me anything. It, it was just... Oh, come on, let's have a drink. Well, how's it going, Chester? Fine, Mr. Dillon. We got visitors. No. Oh, uh... Good evening, Miss Cutler. Alvin. What brings you people into town? You know dang well what brings this, Marshal. Poor Uncle Robert laying back there sick to his death, maybe. And this upstart saying we can't see him. Yeah. Upstart? Well, I'll be now switched just if take I'm it easy, just take, take it easy. Poor old Uncle Robert. Uh, would that be crowbait Bob by any chance? Marshal. Now, you're insulting a dear relative of my wife. What a thing to call Uncle Robert. Why, we had no idea he was took down and ailing this way. No, I don't suppose you did, since you haven't spoken to him in the last five years. Well, that was just a family misunderstanding, Marshal. When one's own kin is took bad sick, a body'd be mighty heartless if they didn't let bygones be bygones. Yeah, sure. Why, well, I even brung him some nice chicken broth and baked him an egg custard pie. That's real thoughtful of you, Miss Gutter. You must have heard the rumors. Rumors? About him turning out to be wealthy. Why, we hadn't that heard a thing. That dance hall about... girl ain't getting one cent, Marshal. No, sir. We'll take her to court. Why don't you do that, Elvin, if you know some way of beating a legal will? Well, he was out of his mind. Doc and I'll say different. We demand to see him. Right this minute. I'm sorry. He left orders against it. Well, then take that food back to him and tell him who brung it. That'll change his mind. All right. Chester. Yes, sir? Take this back to the cell, will you? All right. He's asleep for a little while. Well, if he's asleep, just leave him. All right, sir. You be sure and tell him we brung it. Oh, I'll hire a brass man and tell the whole cousin... Now, Marshal, you know that's a terrible thing. A woman like that to undermine a, a, a man's feelings for his own kin. Look, Elvin, if you want to do something for him, why don't you pay off some of his bills around town? Pay off his bills? That's right. Ten or fifteen dollars to Moss Grimmick, twenty or so to Wilbur Jonas at the general store. Why don't he pay him himself if he's got now, all that money? Now, wait a minute, money. Ruth. It might just make him stop and think twice if we was to pay him off. Pay? Good money on bills, that worthless oh, old Oh, shut up, rat. Ruth. All righty, Marshal. We won't bother you no longer. We'll be going now. Elvin, what are you Come on, about? Ruth. Good night, Marshal. Uh. Mr. Dillon. Huh? What's wrong, Chester? We better find Doc in a hurry, Mr. Dillon. That old man don't look too good. Good pie, Mr. Dillon. Even if old Miss Gudler did bake it. 
Yeah, it looks real good, Chester. Makes a man feel kindly funny eating it, though. No? Well, I reckon old crowbait wouldn't want to go to waste. No, I don't think he would. Mm. I wonder what is in that box, Mr. Dillon. I don't know. But we'll find out as soon as Kitty comes over. Mm. Died in his sleep, Doc said. Peaceful as anything. Mm-hmm. Uh, if you really ain't gonna eat that last piece of pie... I haven't Orton. eaten any of it, Chester. Well, why don't you finish it, huh? Yeah, it oughtn't to go the way it started. No. Hmm. Oh, oh, Kitty. Kitty, come on in. Doc told me, Matt. I'm real sorry. Yeah, I know, Kitty. Poor old fella. Well, I hope he had a good life somewhere back along the line. His last years sure weren't very happy. No. Well, here's a box, Kitty. It's all yours. I wish he hadn't done it, Matt. Why not? Oh, I don't know. Looks like I did things for him just because I expected something. I just felt sorry for him, that's all. Well, I wouldn't count any chickens ahead of time. I don't even you. care what's in it. It's just that I... Marshal. Oh, come in, Elvin. Marshal. You tricked us. All that good hard cash paid you out for You folks nothing. acquainted with Miss Kitty Russell here? Huh. Hey. I know who they are, Matt. Yeah. How do you figure I tricked you, Elvin? How do I... Well, them bills are his. I paid out $86.40 in that old soak before I run into Doc, found out he'd died. And him without even knowing what we'd done for him. You ought to be ashamed of yourselves. Oh, mighty fine talk for you, doing his kin out of what's rightfully there. Oh, you beady-eyed old ghost. Why are you, you little hussy? Take it easy. All right, settle down. Do is whine All right, settle down. So you think I tricked you, huh, Elvin? Well, you don't think I'd have paid them bills if I'd known he was that far gone. And I thought I was giving you a chance to do something decent for once in your lives. We ain't responsible for his debts. No, not legally. Well, now he's not... gone and died. He left all his wealth to this here... this here woman. The way I hear, that box is full of diamonds and emeralds. Whatever it's full of, it belongs to Kitty, so you may as well forget it. Forget it? When a fortune that's rightfully owned is laying right there on that table and about to slip through our fingers... You get your hands up, Marshal. You too, Chester. Elvin. Elvin, that was a real foolish move you just made. You know. Now you hand over the gun. Stay back, Marshal. I'll, I'll shoot. Elvin, I said hand over the now, gun. Marshal, so help me if you take <laughs> one more... Oh, you hit him! You hit Elvin! All right, drag him back and lock him up, Chester. Yes, Mr. Dillon. All right, come on. You're locking up, Elvin. Assault with a deadly weapon. Judge Bent will figure it's worth about a hundred dollars in good hard cash, Miss Cutler. And court's at ten in the morning if you want to be there. But what'll I do tonight? Why don't you get yourself a room over at the Dodge House and meditate on your sins? My sins. Good night, Miss Cutler. Oh. Well, now I suppose. Uh, you want to take a look at your diamonds and emeralds, huh, Kitty? Mm. Can't we just burn it, Matt? Not even open it? Uh, Crowbait wouldn't have wanted you to do that. Yeah, well, I know. But... Anyhow, you got too much curiosity to do something like that, and you know it. Yeah. Well, you win, Matt. Okay, let's see now. Yeah, I guess if we break the seal on the catch. There we go. Matt... It's full of banknotes. Yeah. Confederate banknotes, Kitty. Well, what do you know? You suppose he thought they might fight the war over again someday, Matt? Uh, maybe. Now, wait a minute. There's something underneath here. Oh, what is it, Matt? It's an Army medal. Bravery in action. Field citation. Awarded to Lieutenant Robert Danford Conroy. So that was his name. For conspicuous heroism during the storming of Chapultepec Heights, September 13, 1847. Signed, General Winfield Scott, Commander-in-Chief, United States Expeditionary Forces in Mexico. Here's a silver dollar, Matt. Uh-huh. Well, at least that's worth something. Oh, look. 
There's a ribbon. Yeah. Silk hair bow. Tied to a curl. Lock of hair. The story of a man's life, his most prized possessions. Uh, from November 10th, 1956, Crowbait Bob. I'm Wyatt Cox. Thank you for tuning in to Classic Radio Theater here on your favorite radio station. The conclusion comes up next. A reminder, you can hear our shows anytime at classicradio.stream. That's classicradio.stream. Now on Classic Radio Theater with Wyatt Cox, the conclusion of Gunsmoke, Crowbait Bob, November 10th, 1956. They're going through what Crowbait Bob left Kitty. Let's listen to the rest of it. Matt, I wonder who she was. Well, whoever, it was a long time ago. Metal, a curl, dollar, a box full of worthless paper. Story of a man's life, Matt. Yeah. And there have been worse stories. Well, I'll keep the curl and the metal. And you know something? What? We'll spend the dollar on a drink. <laughs> All right, Kitty, I think I'd have please him. Come on. In a moment, our star, William Conrad. Every year in America, property losses through fire amount to around $800 million. And 90% of these fires are caused by human carelessness. We put a match to $720 million bills every 12 months unnecessarily. Every 20 seconds, fire breaks out somewhere in the United States. Three fires will start while this announcement is being read. The cost in human life is even more shocking than the property losses. 11,000 people die every year in fires, and thousands more are severely burned and disfigured for life. These losses do not have to continue. Each of us can protect his home from fire by following these simple safety rules. Don't smoke in bed. Clean out flammable debris and have it carted away. Repair or replace worn and defective electrical equipment. Use cleaning fluids that won't burn. In other words... Don't give fire a place to start. This has been a CBS Radio public service announcement. Hello, this is Bill Conrad, dropping the role of Matt Dillon for a moment to remind you to cast your vote next Tuesday in one of the most important elections of our time. After you've voted, don't forget CBS Radio is going to be reporting to you over this station the election story with the most comprehensive coverage in broadcasting history. Be with us next Tuesday, won't you? After you voted. Gunsmoke. Produced and directed by Norman MacDonald, stars William Conrad as Matt Dillon, U.S. Marshal. The story was specially written for Gunsmoke by Les Crutchfield, with editorial supervision by John Meston. The music was composed and conducted by Rex Corey. Sound patterns by Ray Kemper and Bill James. Join us again next week for another specially transcribed story on Gunsmoke. From November 10th, 1956, an episode of Gunsmoke here on Classic Radio Theater with Wyatt Cox. And, uh... In in a couple of minutes here, we'll have the uh, an episode of Yours Truly, Johnny Dollar. Civil defense is common sense. This is Joni James. After nuclear attack, a radioactive fallout will be a potential threat to every living thing. You can't hear, or smell, or taste fallout. Often you can't see it, uh, so you must take shelter and stay there until told it's safe to leave. Hello, everyone. This is Robert Merrill. In the American Cancer Society's vast effort to control cancer, there is one aspect that interests me particularly. This is the fellowship program for outstanding young doctors. Here are men who have devoted years to preparing themselves for their profession, college, medical school, 
interning, and perhaps more time as resident physicians. Many promising careers are open to them at this point, careers which will support their families comfortably. Yet, they accept American Cancer Society fellowships at $50 a week. Now, these dedicated young scientists are working for us. We owe it to ourselves to help them in this tremendous fight against man's cruelest enemy. We can and we must help this fellowship program as well as the other valuable endeavors of the American Cancer Society. Give generously. Mail your contribution today to Cancer, care of your local post office. And now on Classic Radio Theater with Wyatt Cox, Part 4, the five-part Yours Truly Johnny Dollar Story, The Lorico Diamond Matter, from November 10th, 1955. From Hollywood, it's time now for... Johnny Dollar. This is Abdul. Abdul? You don't know me. So? I have the little business. Well, I'm so happy for you. I hope it's doing well. <laughs> Not bad. Okay, you what... You don't know me, but you're looking for me. Now look, Joe, Abdul... Uh, it... It is a business to uh, get jobs for people, for servants. Oh, the employment agent. Huh. Have you got the address of that girl who worked for the Countess d'Atelier? Oh, sure. You're very lucky. She's very pretty. You've got the wrong idea, Abdul. I just want to talk to her. <laughs> sure. Where does she live? For $20, I will remember. I'll give you 10 No, she's worth more. Look, knock it off. i got to find her and talk to her fast while I'm still alive. And while she is. Tonight and every weekday night, Bob Bailey and the transcribed adventures of the man with the action-packed expense account. America's fabulous freelance insurance investigator. Yours truly, Johnny Dollar. From Special Investigator Johnny Dollar, location Algiers, North Africa, to the Home Office Transworld Fidelity Company, Hartford, Connecticut. Assignment, the Lorco Diamonds matter. $100,000 worth missing. Expense account continued. (laughs) Item 9, $15 even. Gratuity, tip, gift, bonus. Ah, why kid about it? It was a bribe. To a man named Abdul for the address of a girl named Chata. An address up in the native quarter, the Casbah. But the idea wasn't romance, no matter what Abdul thought. Four hours earlier in the Countess d'Atelier's apartment, somebody had turned on the gas and tried to kill one or both of us. It was nine to one that the somebody was Chata the servant. I wanted to ask her why. I'd put my coat on and was just on the point of leaving my hotel. I slipped a gun into my side pocket and moved over to the door. Yeah, who is it? Charlie Barrett. The guy you beat the daylights out of a couple hours ago, you know what I mean? No hard feelings, Dollar. I just want to talk it over. All right, Barrett. What's on your mind? You object if I come inside? It's kind of personal, you know what I mean? Probably. All right, come on in. Much obliged. Hey, I didn't know who you were, but when we when we got in that little fracas, that their cop told me about it afterward. Man, you really got a wallop on you. You make a fella know he's had it, you know what I mean? Is that why you're here, a post-mortem on the fight? No, 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 it's done and over. You whip me, fair and square, as far as I'm concerned. Hey, Barrett, if you've got anything to say, let's have it fast. I'm in a hurry to get out of here. Oh, well, I sure don't want to take up no more of your time than necessary. I know how it is. Of course, I'm on vacation now, but back in Chicago, I'm in a meat business. Look, Barrett, will you Uh, please... At least in a way I am. I'm in uh, byproducts, actually. You know what they say, use everything but the squeal? Well, I'm the fella that cans a squeal, you get it? Oh, brother... What I come here for was maybe to get it straightened out about that dame. Do you mean the Countess d'Atelier? Countess, Countess, them titles are a dime a dozen. I can buy them, sell them like sausages. Well, what about her? Now, look, neighbor, I was figuring to come here and put it to you man to man. You know what I mean? I know what I'm beginning to think you mean. I figure when you've seen my position, you'd want to do the square thing. Like anybody on the right side of the fence would. You with me, neighbor? You better drop that neighbor business. I've moved. Well, Dollar, the thing stacks up like this. Now, I already had my claim staked there before you even got in town. I got a lot of money invested in that dame. Barrett, so help me. I've been taking her around places, you know, feeding her, buying her, one thing and another. Why, I was even going to kick through for a 20 grand chunk of ice for her. Well, she and I had that fight last week. You what? That dame's got highfalutin what ideas. What fight? What are you talking about? Well, I just put it to her, cold turkey. I told her she had to quit Jenny flipping around with all those other fellas. 
Or I just wasn't going to have nothing more to do with her. Well, that made her mad, you understand? She lit into me. Man, you ought to hear that damn talk when she's mad. You'd, you'd think hey, that look, she... Hey, look, when was this fight? Was it before the diamonds were sent here? We well, sure. Sure, I said if that's the way she was going to act, she could forget about them diamonds. Well, I ain't seen her since. I talked to her, but I just can't... I just can't seem to get her off my mind. Now, look, Dolly, you was in her apartment there for two hours and 40 minutes tonight, and I don't like it. It bothers me. Strictly business, Barrett. And I got to get going. Now, I'll wait a minute. You. Wait a minute, Dolly. Just wait a minute. We, we still got something to settle here. Like I told you, I, I got I'll Barrett money. get out. Hey, you better hold your horses. I don't know if you know the, the name C.K. Barrett, if that means anything to you. But I got influence back there in the United States. So what's the hard way, huh? Look, you just work for that company of yours. You're nothing but an employee. And if you think you can talk to me like you can to some of these foreigners, then... Here, now! Still a sucker for a left. Hello, room service. This is Johnny Dolly. Some drunk just wandered in here and passed out. Would you send up a couple of boys to drag it out in the hall? Expense account item 10, $5.30. A tip to the bellboys and taxi fare to the Casbah. The taxi dropped me off at the end of the causeway, and from there on I walked. It was late, well after midnight. But the narrow, crooked alleys were teeming with life. Some of it out in the open, some of it undercover. Small groups of people met together here and there along the cobbled streets. Men of two dozen tongues and dialects. And women, too, slipped silently in and out of the dark doorways, crouched over tables in the dim-lit cafes and coffee houses. Groups usually fell silent when I passed and stared with hostile curiosity. The Casbah, backwash of North Africa. Little known, seldom bothered, and scarcely policed. And for an outsider, especially at night, more dangerous than dynamite. The address Abdul had given me turned out to be a coffee house, but it could still be legitimate. And there was only one way to find out. What do you want? I want to see Chana. What for? Private reasons. Chata's not here. Where can I find him? Take a seat, table in the corner. Maybe she come. I took the seat, ordered coffee, and waited. A wrinkled old Arab squatted on a rug in the middle of the room and played strange, weird melodies. Gradually, the other patrons went back to their conversations, ignoring me completely. In fact, pointedly. Twenty minutes passed. The girl didn't show. You will, of course, not object, monsieur, if I take the liberty of joining you. No, sit down. Merci. So, you wish to see Chat. Yeah, that's right. Do you know her? Oui. I know her very well. Know where to find her? But naturally, monsieur. I always know where to find her. She's my woman. Ah, so you're the man they call Bobo. Oui, monsieur. The man who poisoned the diamond courier. Oh, monsieur. It is true that I gave him some wine. A little, not much. But I think perhaps it was a bad vintage. Yes, most unfortunate. It was for him. Well, perhaps it was for the best. Life is so uncertain. But I do not wish to think of such unpleasantness. Instead, uh, let us talk about diamonds. Let's talk about killing, or attempted killing. Is Chanda the one who turned on the gas in the Countess's apartment? Well, it is possible that she did that. On whose orders? It was nothing personal, monsieur. I didn't even know that you were going to be there. I see. Then you really meant to... Diamonds, monsieur. That's enough of this foolish talk of killing. <sighs> All right. All right, what about the diamonds? You were sent here by the company that has insured them. Is that not correct? Yeah, that's right. And this company would like very much to recover these diamonds? That's why I'm here. C'est bien. Now, I'm told that these companies sometimes give large rewards, agree to an arrangement of a sort. Make a deal, you mean, with no questions asked. Yes, exactly. Now, is this thing true, monsieur? Is it possible that you would... Do you have the diamonds, Bobo? Well, let us say that I'm able to direct you to their location. You could almost call that a confession. Hmm. 
What does it matter? So long as we are in the Casper. Oh, yeah, sure. I imagine you have men spotted all over the place. At least 30, right in this room. I'm in no danger here, Monsieur. Tell me something. You didn't pull off this job by yourself. Who else was in on it? I only wish to talk about the diamonds. Well, can we come to an arrangement? Bobo, I don't make deals with murderers. It is better that you do not use such words, monsieur. It's true, though, isn't it? That is not the question. It is only that I resent the insulting way. Bobo! Which you... Bobo, the gendarme! What? Why are you coming here? Bobo! Oui, oui, oui. Did you arrange for the police to come here, monsieur? I'm as surprised as you are, Bobo. Ah, consider this matter of the deal. We will talk more at some other time, eh? Allez, go, go, the patrons rushed for the doors, and in one minute flat, the coffee house was empty. Even the owner was gone. I was the only one left. Three minutes later, the inspector, with a flying squad of 20 men, came bursting in from the street. Well, Monsieur Deller, I'm happy to find you are still alive. Why don't you get lost somewhere? For you, I think it most fortunate that we arrive in time. Oh, sure, in time to foul up the only lead I had in this case. To lose a suspect is better than to lose one's life, Monsieur. Look, Inspector, I was holding a gun in my pocket, covering Bobo from the second he sat down at the table. But, Monsieur, so I... 30 men or not, if it had come to a showdown, he couldn't have done a thing. Because he'd have been the first one to get it, and he's smart enough to have known that. But I thought Let's that... face it, Inspector, you've done it again. You goofed. But I was only thinking that perhaps... Mon Dieu, what is to happen next? The shooting was somewhere outside, but it hadn't been the police. All of the inspector's men were inside the coffee house. He gave them orders quickly, and they fanned out to search the area. The streets were empty now, dark and silent, not a soul in sight. We split up into pairs. I worked with Inspector Marcus for a while, then left him and searched alone along a narrow side passage. And that's where I found him. He'd been shot three times in the back, and he was dying. Monsieur Dada. Yeah, Bobo. You you can't forget that deal, I think. Yeah. It's a little too late for deals now. <sighs> Who was in on it with you, Bobo? Look, you've got nothing to lose by talking. You know that, don't you? Except my honor, monsieur. As a citizen of the Casper. Who shot you? A dragon, monsieur. Twelve feet tall. With fiery eyes. All right, Bobo, all right. But just tell me this. Just one thing. Are you the man who attacked the property agent at the airport? The man who slug André Jordin? Oui, monsieur. I do it very good. No. Almost I kill him. It's too bad. I... I... A minute or two later, Inspector Marcus came up and we stood there looking down at the dead man lying on the stones of the alley. He was a short man, stockily built with wide shoulders and a deep chest. It was the body of a man of action, of accomplishment. But he'd chosen to be a smuggler, dope peddler, thief, and killer. And now he had become the victim of another killer. Did he say anything, monsieur? Was he able to talk? Yeah, enough. Eh? What is it you mean, monsieur? Do you know who is guilty of this? Yeah, that's right, Inspector. I know the whole story now. The whole filthy, rotten story. There will be the final intriguing episode in our story of the Lorco Diamonds matter tomorrow. Tomorrow night, the odds are set. The last chip is down. It's the last spin of the wheel. And death is the croupier. Join us, won't you? Yours truly, Johnny Dollar. Yours truly, Johnny Dollar, starring Bob Bailey, is transcribed in Hollywood. Written by Les Crutchfield, it is produced and directed by Jack Johnstone. Be sure to join us tomorrow night, same time and station, for the next exciting episode of Yours Truly, Johnny Dollar. Roy Rowan speaking. <laughs> Thank you.
From November 10th, 1955, yours truly, Johnny Dollar, here on Classic Radio Theater with Wyatt Cox. want to thank our friend Ted at RadioMemories.com. He supplied us with a lot of these yours truly, Johnny Dollar programs. And uh, you can contact Ted about his restoration programs he's going through and uh, uh, making significant upgrades to his shows that he has there at RadioMemories.com. He supplies shows on cassette, CD, or on flash drive for your computer at very, very reasonable prices. Check out our friend Ted at RadioMemories.com and tell him I sent you by, won't you please? Uh, Thank this station, support their advertisers. It's their kindness and courtesy that allows us to be with her, with you here each and every time we roll around here on your favorite station. Miss a day? You don't have to miss a show. All of our shows are available on demand at classicradio.stream. You can stream our shows on demand, learn more about classic radio collecting. There's a list of places where you can download our shows from. You can find our social media links, and uh, you can contact me, and you can also buy me a coffee. That buy me a coffee money is what helps us uh, acquire additional classic radio theater shows from collectors we appreciate you doing that it's a nice thing for you to do and uh, tell all your friends great radio shows are right here at this spot on the dial classic radio theater with wyatt cox on your favorite radio station